All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's our pleasure this week to have Sean English from Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who's going to tell us about generalized Ramsey numbers. Take it away, Sean. All right. Uh, thank you, Deepak, Deepak um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's been a little while since I've, I've given a talk, but um, hopefully this will still be entertaining. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about a project I did. Um, it culminated uh, at the end of uh, 2021, but a lot of it, it actually started uh, before the pandemic. Uh, so it took a little bit longer just because obviously everything moving online slowed a lot of stuff down, but I, I think it's an interesting project. Um, but before we get into the project itself, I do want to mention the, the people I had the pleasure to work with. Uh, so these are my co-authors. Um, Yoji Balog is a professor at um, University of Illinois. He's actually my uh, postdoc mentor there. And then um, I also had the pleasure to work with two graduate students. Uh, well, one, she was a graduate student at the time. Uh, so Emily Heath, uh, she was a graduate student uh, under Yoji, but now she's actually a postdoc at the University of Iowa. And then uh, Bob Kruger is my other co-author, which he is currently a graduate student. Um, and he's very, very good. So if you all ever um, need a postdoc, he will be graduating in a few years and definitely a, a good person to look for when he hits the market. Okay, so uh, where does this topic start? So to kind of begin, um, I wanna mention something about multicolor Ramsey numbers. So if you're not familiar with this, um, the um, Ramsey number, R sub K of P, uh, this is just gonna be the diagonal Ramsey number. So I want to um, find the least integer N such that if I color the complete graph KN, if I edge color the complete graph KN with K colors, um, that there's guaranteed to exist a monochromatic KP. And uh, so this is uh, quite an old problem that's been studied for quite a while. Um, in, it was originally studied in 1935 by Erdős and Sekerős. Uh, they provided both an upper and a lower bound, and it ends up that their upper bound, which is um, k to the kp, is actually still the, the best upper bound. Um, and then the lower bound had a few very small improvements, but only very, very recently did we get some major improvement to it. Um, in 2020, Conlin and Ferber were able to improve the lower bound after um, essentially only very, very minor improvements since 1935. Um, and then Wigderson made a very small improvement to the Conlin and Ferber technique. And so this lower bound that you see here is by Wigderson. But I do want to mention that Conlin and Ferber were really the ones that had the big breakthrough. So I, I do want to quote both of those authors, but I, I do want to emphasize that even though this is not Conlin and Ferber's bound, they really had a, a very new idea, and then Wigderson just kind of optimized their idea. Um, and so when you think about Ramsey numbers, you're always looking for a monochromatic clique, but what if instead of necessarily requiring that we, we want our cliques to be monochromatic, what if we loosen the problem a little bit by allowing our cliques to have a few um, colors, but not very many colors? So obviously for something like the normal, like. Um, the two color Ramsey number, well, you don't want to allow your cliques to have two colors because then you're only using two colors. But here, when we're dealing with K colors, you could have K equals 100. And then you could ask just, you don't want your cliques to have um, three colors. or You don't want your cliques to have four colors on them. So this uh, gives you a slightly different sort of problem, but still very related to these um, Ramsey numbers. Um, and in particular, uh, we're going to look at this function FNPQ. And I know like, a function with uh, three inputs like this uh, kind of makes your eyes like glaze over unless if you're pretty familiar with it, but what's going on here? So N is always gonna be the number of vertices and we're always gonna be think about that being very, very large. So this is actually going to be uh, this function, the output is gonna be a number of colors. And I wanna know the least number of colors such that if I color KN with that number of colors, um, I can color it in a way that every P clique sees at least Q colors. Um, and so an example, if you look at this, uh, here I've colored um, K6 with three colors. Um, and it ends up, if you look at any K4, any subgraph with four vertices, you'll be able to find that um, there's none of them that only have two colors. I, I actually have um, every one of them sees at least three colors. 
And it ends up if I were to try to color K6 with only two colors, well, it, it's kind of easy to see that I definitely will have a K4 with only two colors. Um, and so this actually shows that for um, six vertices, uh, uh, four clique with three, um, wanting each four clique to see three colors, I need at least three colors to do it, and I can do it with three colors. Um, and this, it seems a little bit different than Ramsey, because usually with Ramsey, you think about the number of vertices, like your, your output, the Ramsey function is the number of vertices. Um, here, our output is the number of colors, but these are essentially just inverse problems of each other. In particular, if you want to like figure out what the diagonal Ramsey number is, it ends up if we know the values of Fn p2, so I want every p clique to see at least two colors, that's kind of like saying, I don't have um, a Ramsey graph every, like I don't have a, a P, monochromatic P clique. Um, so if I have every P clique sees at least two colors, then this Ramsey number is actually just going to be the minimum of um, N when these numbers are equal to one more color than what I see here. So if I wanna use K colors for the Ramsey number, um, that first time that I, I'm guaranteed to, um, to have a monochromatic clique is when I have to use one more color to avoid the monochromatic clique. So um, these generalized Ramsey numbers, they're, they encompass um, all of the diagonal Ramsey numbers, but then obviously when you don't just look at FNP2 and you look at FNP3, FNP4, or any other value for that second or for that third coordinate, you get very different behavior where again, um, every P clique, instead of necessarily wanting to be monochromatic, you want a P clique that has um, no more than some number of colors. Okay, so we now have um, these generalized Ramsey numbers. And so the first thing to do um, is to kind of look at a few results that are known in this area. So um, a lot of times what we'll end up doing we always think about n going off to infinity. We'll usually think about p being something reasonably large, and then we'll like kind of try to vary q. So we'll we'll look at n um, off to infinity, p a large constant, and then we want to ask what happens if I go from the p two case, which is like the Ramsey case, to um, letting q be something even maybe close to p choose two. Um, because P choose two is the most colors I could possibly see on a P clique. And so one thing we could ask is, when do I definitely need to use at least a linear number of colors? And so this is what we call the linear threshold. So if I fix N and P and I have this number of colors, or sorry, if I have um, this Q value, so this is the number of colors I want to see on every P clique, that I am guaranteed I'm gonna need at least a linear number of colors altogether. And very similar, um, if I want to guarantee that I need a quadratic number of colors. So here I, I'm essentially, um, I have uh, a vertex set of size N, I'm using N choose or like N squared colors. So I'm almost coloring every single edge um, completely differently. If I want to guarantee that that happens, then I need Q to be um, as large as this. And so I know that these uh, formulas look a little messy, but let's go ahead and try to look at the combinatorics, the structures that are giving these values to get a little bit of intuition. So for example, with the linear threshold, well, what do I want? I wanna know how, um, how small Q I can get while still allowing for me to have a sublinear number of colors. So if I did have, if I colored my complete graph with a little o of n colors, well then certain vertices have to have arbitrarily large color degree. I have to be able to find a vertex with red color degree um, growing. And in particular, if I look at just a, a P clique that contains one vertex that's adjacent in say blue to all the other vertices, well this P clique here just doesn't have that many colors on it. I mean, I could have the rest of it be completely rainbow, but those edges are all the same color. And so that's exactly what we're getting here where you have this um, P choose two minus something. This minus something is exactly the number of uh, monochromatic. Can you all see my uh, pen by the way? Okay. Um, so this P choose two minus something, this minus something is essentially minus the number of um, repeated colors you see here plus one. 
where the plus one is to just get like a contradiction essentially. Um, and so similarly, if you want to know what the quadratic threshold is, well, if you use less than a quadratic number of colors, well, then you're going to have to have some color classes of unbounded size. And in particular, you can get something, maybe it looks like a matching. That's kind of the worst case. But even if like some of these edges intersected each other, I can definitely pack um, like P over two monochromatic edges into a P clique. Even if all the rest is completely um, rainbow, I'm still going to not have that many colors on that P clique. And not that many, I mean, if you look at these numbers, you're always close to P choose two. You're always close to rainbow, but then you're P choose two minus this amount. And in fact, usually when we do this problem, well, the, the numbers are usually phrased in terms of, I want to have a P clique with at least this number of colors. Most of the time, what we end up looking for instead is what we call color repetitions. So here, instead of asking how many colors are on this P clique, I want to ask how many edges are repeated. So here on this um, P clique right here, I'm guaranteed to have about P over two repetitions. And so my Q values, I always measure them as like the total number of possible colors minus the number of color repetitions. And that's what we're getting here. Here I have about P repetitions. Here I have about P choose two repetitions. And it ends up that these very easy um, lower bounds are actually the truth. Um, we can give matching upper bounds where if I actually do have um, these Q values, I can actually give you a coloring where um, with this first Q value for the linear, I can give you a coloring with a linear number of colors that avoids having, um, or that where each P clique does see this many colors. And similarly for the quadratic threshold, I, well, it's very easy for me to give you a quad, uh, coloring with a quadratic number of colors that meets this because I could just color everything um, completely rainbow. And so the, uh, Oh, can, yeah. I, can I ask, uh, I'm confused a little bit about what a color repetition counts. So a uh, color repetition, essentially, um, well, I want it to be, if I have two blue edges, I want that to count as one color repetition. If I have five blue edges, I want that to count as four color repetitions. Um, so in particular, I need, you need to essentially like look at all of the colors that you see um, minus the, essentially it's, one way to measure it is to look at all of the edges minus the total number of colors. That will give you the color repetitions. But a lot of times- oh, I see, okay, gotcha. All right. So yeah. just basically, yeah, P, uh, uh, P minus the number of different colors. Or P, P choose two minus the number P of choose two instead of, gotcha, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but a lot of times we end up looking at something like this matching and say, okay, there's, uh, P over two edges in this matching, all but one of them are color repetition because they're all monochromatic. So it's like, we'll usually look at, like you can express it in different ways, but a lot of times you express it as like the sum over all colors, the number of edges of that color minus one. And so that's how we'll actually, most of the time keep track of this and how we'll actually try to count um, what Q value makes sense is, is we'll measure these repetitions and always express it as P choose two minus the number of repetitions. Any other questions? Okay, so before I start talking about what we did, I do want to mention um, a related problem. And uh, I'm going to kind of try to tell a story to motivate what we did. But I, I'm going to say from the outset that the story I'm going to tell is actually a bit of a lie. I'm going to pretend like things went in a slightly different order than they did, because again, it, it does motivate what we did, but we actually found this problem from a slightly different way. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and look at this anyways. So um, recently, uh, Kalman and Tompkin looked at a certain type of problem. We're here, um, if I have two uh, subgraphs of an edge colored KN, I'm gonna call them color isomorphic, if first off they're isomorphic, but then also that isomorphism sends um, the same colors to the same colors, uh, kind of exactly what you'd expect for two subgraphs of an edge colored graph to be color isomorphic. Um, and so Conlon and Tompkin asked under what conditions, um, if I color edge color complete graph, under what conditions are they guaranteed to have many color isomorphic copies of some fixed graph F? 
And they define this function f sub k of n and f. Um, so again, this is going to be the least number of colors such that um, there exists a proper coloring of Km without k vertex disjoint color isomorphic copies of this fixed graph f. So here, um, one thing that's a little weird for our setting is that they're dealing with proper colorings. Um, whereas like with generalized Ramsey numbers, we definitely don't. And then here, instead of necessarily just looking for how many color repetitions you have in a, in a clique, um, they're looking for not having many copies of the same graph showing up. Um, and it ends up that you can actually relate these generalized Ramsey numbers to this common Tomkin problem. And now I know that this is a pretty messy formula, but like kind of try to ignore some of the, the mess a little bit. And what do we see here? So we're seeing uh, our p value, or the number of like the clique that we're looking at to try to have a lot of colors on it is k times the number of vertices of some, oh, this should be an f. I'm sorry, this should be vertices of f. Um, this p value will be k times the number of vertices in some sparse graph f. And then the repetitions that we're getting. So here, this is k times that minus two. So we're looking for k minus one times the number of edges, color repetitions. And um, where is this coming from? Well, if we kind of look at a picture, if I look at a p clique, I can just put a bunch of these color isomorphic copies inside of that P clique. That's going to take, if I put K color isomorphic copies, that's going to take this many vertices. And how many color repetitions do I get? Well, one of these copies of F can be completely new colors. It could be completely rainbow and we don't get any color repetitions there, but every other one gives us all, like all the same colors, they're color isomorphic. And so K minus one copies of this graph give us color repetition. So this is what's going on here. So if we have less than this number of colors, then we're guaranteed to find these structures. And that gives us a contradiction to this plus one right here. We always need that little plus one to say, um, we really want one more um, extra color here. We have too many color repetitions. That plus one uh, makes it so that we actually get that we cannot color it with this many colors. So this is quite nice because if we can solve something about this Conlon Tompkin problem, we get results on or lower bounds on the Erdős Jarfosh problem, the generalized Ramsey problem. But Conlon Tompkin is a lot stronger than what we actually need here. They're finding K color isomorphic graphs, and those are what are giving us our color repetitions. Um, and they're also restricting down to specifically looking at proper colorings. For the um, generalized Ramsey number, we definitely don't need proper colorings. And we don't really care if um, we find K color isomorphic graphs. If we could just find K graphs that have like the same number of edges and color patterns, even if they're different, that's still gonna work out. So under the fact that we can deal with like slightly weaker conditions for our problem, can we use similar ideas to what we just saw here in order to still get different bounds? And so the idea is instead of looking for color isomorphic copies of a graph, oh, this says game, but it should be graph, I'm sorry. Um, we can try to find nice color homomorphic copies. So we definitely can't use any, other, any old homomorphism here. We, we need to be dealing with um, ones that will guarantee certain nice properties. But a lot of what the rest of the talk will be is, is me trying to, to convince you of what sufficiently nice means in this case. So this is the idea. And so for example, here, uh, what do I mean by color homomorphic copy? Well, I could write a technical definition, but it's not too hard to figure it out. If here I have a, an eight cycle F, well, one color homomorphic copy is just have an isomorphic copy. Um, so here, not only do I have an isomorphism between the two, but the colors are preserved by that. Um, but I could also have something like my eight cycle wrapping in around on itself twice. Note here that I actually do have to have like this orange edge be the same color as this orange edge for this to be a color homomorphic copy. But as long as those are the same color, they could get mapped to each other. And you can have a lot of different pictures going on. All of these um, are color homomorphic copies. And uh, most of these would be A-OK -okay for our version of the problem. We don't necessarily need, if we're going to do something like try to look for K things that look like this eight cycle, um, most of these pictures would be okay. This four cycle 
is going to be a little tricky because we actually don't get the number of repetitions we want, but that's what we'll try to deal with with the sufficiently nice part of this. So how are we going to find, so, so again, the idea is we want to find K color homomorphic copies of a graph rather than color isomorphic. So how do we find homomorphic copies or color homomorphic copies of a graph in an edge colored complete graph? Well, this is where- oh, Sorry, we... sorry. Um, could you go back to the previous slide for a second? Yeah. Is the point that that one had, the, the four cycle has less edge. It, it doesn't have eight edges anymore, basically, or something? Yeah. Because so you, you I... wrapped that, like you can identify vertices, but maybe not edges in these homomorphisms or something. Well, so what what I want is if I like did the color isomorphic like thing with these eight cycles, I would get three eight cycles. Say I'm doing this with like uh, three copies, I get three eight cycles, and that would give me sixteen color repetitions. The first eight cycle is all new. The next two eight cycles are all repetitions. So I get sixteen color repetitions. If instead I got one eight cycle and two four cycles, I'm no longer getting sixteen color repetitions. And so in order to actually get the right number of color repetitions for what I'm expecting, um, these sorts of graphs, these sorts of homomorphisms are a little bit trickier to deal with. Does that make sense? Okay. These ones that actually have the same number of edges as my original graph, those ones are a-okay. I don't care that they don't look like an eight cycle. I just care about the fact that I'm getting the right number of repetitions. The four cycle does not give me that right number of color repetitions. Okay, so I want to find um, K color homomorphic graphs that all give me the, the same number of um, color repetitions. So how do I find color homomorphic graphs? Well, let's say I'm looking at a, a complete graph that has, um, has been edge colored with C colors. I can define what's called the Rth color energy graph. So um, this is going to be an auxiliary graph where the vertex set is just ordered R tuples of the vertices. Um, and then I'm going to make an edge between the two R tuples if essentially they're matched with all those edges in the matching being the same color. So U1, V1, that edge is the same color as U2, V2, that edge is the same color as U3, V3. And note here that I'm not even necessarily assuming that these are different vertices. Like U1 could be the same thing as U5, U1 could be the same thing as V7, so on and so forth. But I, I just want each of these edges across um, from U1, V1 to be the same as U2, V2, um, so on and so forth. Um, and then the idea is if I look at this Rth color energy graph, if I find something there, hopefully if, if it's nice enough, it should actually translate to R different homomorphisms in my original graph. But in order to actually make it so that I get something that's sensible when I go from my color energy graph to my original graph, we need to kind of delete some of these edges and make it so that this color energy graph is a little bit nicer. Um, so Fish, Bahada, and Shuffer were able to show that if we take this our color energy graph, we can actually find a subgraph of it um, with some nice properties. In particular, um, the vertex set of our color energy graph, which I'll denote with like a G with a, um, a vector over it, to kind of denote that the, um, the vertices are R tuples. Um, we can actually uh, take our vertex set and separate it into R pieces, where we're only looking at edges inside of those R pieces, none across. Um, if we have two vertices at distance two in our color energy graph, then they actually won't uh, share any coordinates. So if I have, um, I mentioned earlier that just the color energy graph U1 could be the same thing as V7. Um, if these two vertices are at, at distance um, two from each other, they're actually not going to be allowed to have those two same coordinates. So that'll be helpful when we're actually trying to show that these homomorphisms are nice. Um, and then in addition, um, in addition to be able to give this um, R partite um, or this equipartition, inside of each equipartition, we can actually Im impose an internal bipartite structure um, just using a, a very easy probabilistic argument, essentially it's, it's the same thing as um, showing that the largest bipartite graph has at least half the edges. Uh, we can impose these properties without losing too much. Um, in particular, we can impose these properties 
while still maintaining that the number of edges in our um, color energy graph is um, about what we want. So we, we lose a few constant factors here, but the number of edges is, is something that we understand we have upper and lower bounds for this color energy graph. So we can impose these nice structures. And then what do we want to do with these structures? Well, we want to, again, we want to find a certain graph in my color energy graph and then show that this will give me um, nice copies of this in my original graph. So if I find, for example, an eight cycle in my color energy graph, uh, let's say I'm doing a three uh, color, a three color energy graph. So I have all of my vertices are three tuples. Well, um, because of the pruning we did, I can actually find in uh, my vertex at G is partitioned into three pieces. And in each of those three pieces, I do get a homomorphic copy of um, this eight cycle. And unfortunately, I can still have like some issues with how they look. But one really nice thing is due to this equal partition, these aren't going to be overlapping on each other. So if I actually do get, if I, if I see three copies, um, if I see an edge in each copy that are the same color, there are actually three distinct edges, which is quite nice. Um, and I mentioned here, I don't know why this text disappeared, but um, I could actually impose in addition to um, these being completely disjoint, I could actually make it so that since my original eight cycle is bipartite, that each of these three copies are bipartite. So if I had a reason to, I could actually exclude this structure from happening. Sometimes I don't really care, uh, but sometimes being able to impose that the homomorphisms I get are actually bipartite, um, that can be quite helpful. Okay, so uh, before we start actually looking at how to use this, let me kind of give a, a recap of the color energy techniques. I know I threw a lot at you. So this is kind of like the high level idea of how this technique is going to work. So, um, what we want to do is we want to find we want to find a clever choice of a bipartite graph. This is going to be like the eight cycle that we're going to try to find copies of this. And some number are like we'll have to be like clever about our choices here. But if we choose these right, we want to get a bound of this form where we're looking for our copies of our bipartite graph, and we want r minus one of them to be completely repeated. So if we want to try to get a bound on this. Well, how could we do that? Uh, again, what we will get a lower bound in this case. Um, we'll fix an edge colored complete, um, clique with some color, some number of colors C. We'll eventually try to solve for C to say that this is bigger than or equal to the choice of C we choose. Uh, we find the rth color energy graph that has end of the, about end of the r vertices, and we know about how many edges it has. Um, if the number of colors we choose is small enough, Due to the fact that B is a bipartite graph, we'll actually be guaranteed that our um, color energy graph has a copy of B. We'll be able to choose C small enough that um, this number gets close enough to um, the number of color energy vertices squared that were bigger than the extremal number for this bipartite graph. So we can indeed find a copy in our, our color energy graph. Um, and then this gives us our disjoint color homomorphic copies in our original graph. And if those are nice enough, then these copies will um, hopefully form a P clique with too few colors. Or here P is this, it will be able to have R times the number of vertices of my bipartite graph with only this many color, or with this many color repetitions. And again, this plus one here is just to make it so that we have an actual contradiction, which will allow us to conclude that this number is bigger than that value of C that we chose. So we um, make a clever choice of B and R. We choose C to make it so that our color energy graph is guaranteed to include that bipartite graph B. And then we show that the um, color homomorphic images we get are nice enough. And again, the, the hard part is the nice enough part. It's, it's not obvious that we should actually have nice homomorphic copies, but, but we, with the pruning we did, we'll be able to get this. All right, so um, with this technique in mind, let's actually see if we can get some actual values for this FNPQ function. Um, so we want to find a bipartite graph and a number of colors, and we want to 
see if we can get something good here. So the first um, uh, example that we can do, uh, we could look at something like the complete, the subdivision of a complete graph. So KT plus, I just take the complete graph, I subdivide each edge exactly once. Uh, this now is a bipartite graph because the subdivision vertices form one part, the original vertices form the other. And we get something that looks kind of like this. Here's a K4 plus, those dotted edges are not actually edges, but those are the original edges for the K4, and each one has been turned into a subdivided edge. Um, why is this uh, easy to use this technique on? Well, what sorts of homomorphic images could we actually see? Well, you could have two of these subdivision vertices actually be the, the same vertex. You could have many of these subdivision vertices to be the same vertex. But for that to happen, the, the um, like for this to happen, the two vertices that that came from here and here, those actually had to correspond to a matching in the original K4 um, because when we pruned our color energy graph, we made it so that any vertices at distance two don't have any repeated coordinates. So this is something we call a P3 preserving um, a homomorphic image AKA if I actually um, look at a P3 in my original graph, it gets mapped to a true P3. And so because of that, it ends up if I just look at just what homomorphic images are P3 preserving, which is something we uh, we know that our, um, the images of our color energy graph will give us, um, any image of KT plus that's P3 preserving has the same number of edges. And so in particular, if I find R copies of those, I'll actually get the number of repetitions I expected. And so this gives us um, this bound here, where the only way we can get everything to work out is if we actually use the two color energy for this case. Um, but we can get that for this value of P, we actually do get two um, color homomorphic images of KT plus that give you the right number of um, of repetitions. And um, independently, uh, Zhu and G actually uh, got essentially the same bound. They weren't looking at this generalized Ramsey number setting. They were looking at the common Tompkin problem. Um, but they're bound, like, because of the observation I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, their bound implies the same thing here. But uh, they, they used a very different technique than we did. And our proof here only is about a half a page, whereas theirs was like an entire paper. Uh, granted, they prove something slightly stronger. So I'm not saying that like, it, it is harder to find instead of uh, these homomorphic images, they found isomorphic images. But uh, we were able to do this for this problem in a, in a much easier setting, at least with all the machinery of the color energy graph. OK, so we got this result. Um, but in general, so we got kind of lucky with KT plus that any P3 preserving homomorphic image had the same number of edges. Um, in general, we really don't expect that to happen. For example, um, if I take a C8 and it turns into a C4, that definitely does not have the same number of edges, but it is P3 preserving. And there's really, at least as far as I know, there's no way to avoid that happening with this technique. Um, but we can still deal with some situations where that sort of thing happens. Um, and so again, going back to the C8 example, um, maybe I try to reveal uh, my C8 in three different coordinates and I get one of them is actually a perfect C8, the other two are C4s. So like this doesn't work because I just, in those second and third coordinates, I don't have enough repetitions. I expected more edges to show up, um, but I, I don't have them. But what I do have is that I didn't actually use as many vertices. I kind of expected for me in each coordinate to use eight vertices and get eight repetitions. But here in V2 and V3, I only use four vertices. So I have a few extra vertices that I can use somehow. Um, and again, I'm always like, whenever we're doing this, we're always kind of shooting for like the same number as all them, them being color isomorphic because you can't really do any better that you can't expect to do any better than that because you could just have all of them be color isomorphic. So you, you can never expect to get better bounds than what um, color isomorphic copies would give, at least using this technique. But so I always want to match that if, as if these were just all color isomorphic copies. So um, 
again, I, I reveal this and I don't have enough edges, but I do have a few extra vertices that I can use somehow. So the idea is instead of um, necessarily uh, finding just a copy of C8, I'm gonna find a copy of C8 with this little gadget, which I call a reservoir, which is essentially just a vertex of high degree. So I find the C8 with a vertex of high degree. That's very easy to do. It doesn't really change the extremal number at all. But then when I'm revealing the C8 in my three coordinates, I'll do it one edge at a time and I'll try to keep track of like what happens at every edge. So I reveal this edge first. And when I reveal that edge, okay, in my three coordinates, I got three new edges. That gives me um, two color repetitions, which is exactly what I would have expected if I was revealing three color isomorphic copies. I reveal another edge. Okay, I get lucky again. I got three new edges. That gives me two color repetitions. Again, I'm right on track for um, if these were just all color isomorphic. I reveal the next one. I'm still right on track. Three edges, two repetitions. Next one, three edges, two repetitions. But then now when I reveal this edge, I don't get that. I, I don't have that. But one thing I can say is that if this happened, if I got this new edge that actually had to have been a, a repetition on its own, because this the only way I could have not gotten three new edges is if that color of those edges actually was already repeated in my structure somehow. Form one of my homomorphic images to cross itself. Well, that has to be using the same color. So this edge is actually one repetition. I wanted two repetitions on this step, but I got one. But then I did not use a vertex in V2 or V3 when I kind of expected to. So I'll go ahead and reveal one of these vertices. And this may be a completely new color, but I can do it in both of these coordinates, which reveals two edges for one repetition, plus this maroon repetition here that gives me the two repetitions I wanted. And again, I only introduced three new vertices, which is what I expected to do if these were all um, color isomorphic images of C8. So even though now this is these are not color isomorphic, well, maybe at this point they are still, but I don't necessarily know if they're going to end up being is, uh, homomorphic anymore. They'll still have the right number of color repetitions. And I can keep going. Again, I reveal this edge. I did not get the three edges with two um, repetitions I wanted. I got only one edge, but that's guaranteed to be a repetition because that's the only way I don't get three edges if any edges show up are a repetition. And then I can use my little gadget to fix the fact that I really wanted another repetition there. And I had those two extra vertices to, to do that. I, again, I reveal the next edge. I didn't get what I wanted. I use my little gadget to get what I want. Do the next edge. I didn't get what I wanted. I use my little gadget. I get what I wanted. And maybe if you weren't following every single little step that I was accounting, uh, that's OK. But you can take a look at these structures and count up the repetitions. It ends up that I have exactly the right number of vertices. I have three times eight vertices. And here, I actually have the right number of color repetitions. Um, compared to if I had a rainbow eight cycle and two uh, color isomorphic copies of that rainbow eight cycle. So using this little gadget, I can kind of fix up this issue that maybe sometimes these things overlap. Um, and so uh, with this gadget, we're able to prove a general theorem, which this is super big and messy. And I was kind of hoping to have a pen because I was going to like show you that you don't have to pay attention to all these words. You can cross a lot of this out and ignore it. Um, I still don't have an ability to actually write anything. I'm, I'm not sure why that wasn't working. But the big thing here is that the way to view this theorem, uh, it's supposed to be kind of a black box. The idea is you check some technical conditions at the top. So ignore what all this says. Just know, check some technical conditions. If you can prove this, which like this T is actually a parameter. So you really just want to like, make all this stuff as big as you can. If you can like do this quantifiable thing, then you get what you want. And get what you want means you don't use too many vertices and you get the number of repetitions that you really want to. So again, don't worry about the, oh, don't worry about the little details here. Again, the idea is uh, we set this up so that all you have to do is you have to prove that this thing is big, which I mean, I'm not saying that that's easy to do, but it's like a straightforward, like you don't have to worry about all the underlying details. 
if you can prove this is big enough, then you get a result on this um, generalized Ramsey number problem. Okay, so with that theorem in hand, we can actually deal with much more complicated structures than something like just a subdivided um, clique that had this nice property that any graph uh, or any two subdivided cliques that are P3, uh, any homomorphism of a sub subdivided clique that's P3 preserving has the same number of edges. We can deal with much um, harder structures to deal with. For example, something like a theta graph. So a theta graph, it's a generalization of a cycle. Uh, theta AB is I have um, two vertices and I have B paths between these two vertices and each path has A edges um, in it. And so here, if B was two, this would just be the um, cycle with uh, two A vertices. Um, and using the fact that we know something about, or we know quite a bit about the extremal number for theta graphs, um, in particular, um, we know that uh, the extremal number for a theta graph is about n to the one plus one over a. Um, and so the idea we can use here is we can take a, a rather large theta graph in our, um, our color energy graph. We can use the fact that the extremal number doesn't really depend on the number of paths as long as our number of paths is constant. Um, and we can use that to deal with some of the, the technical hurdles that show up when you're trying to reveal these things. And again, I wanted to draw a picture here, um, but I still, I, um, I don't know if like the zoom settings are disabled for this or not, but I, I'm not actually able to draw a little picture here, but the idea is we can actually use, we will reveal some of this data graph and we'll actually skip some of the paths. And what we'll end up getting is something that's uh, homomorphic to a, a smaller theta graph but that smaller theta graph will have the repetitions that we want. Um, and so we're able to prove this bound. And again, or sorry, um, this bound was, was proved using the same technique by Fish, Bahada, and Sheffer. So they're the ones that like originally developed this, but they were only able to do this for the two color energy graph. They weren't able to do this for any larger um, uh, R. We were able to extend this to the Rth color energy graph um, and also they were only doing this for cycles. We did this for all theta graphs, including cycles, um, getting this result. Um, and independently, Yanzer did something where Yanzer actually solved the common Tomkin problem for cycles, not theta graphs, but their proof very quickly generalizes the theta graphs. But this actually happened while we were still working on this. Um, so it, it was independent work and it uses a complete, actually, uses some similar techniques, but still very, very different because they're looking for color isomorphic copies. Um, and so I'm going to go a little bit faster now for time. Uh, another uh, structure we were able to apply this to, if you take a um, complete bipartite and you subdivide the edges of the path L times, or sorry, L minus one times. So if you replace each edge of a complete bipartite graph with a path of length L, um, this gives you a structure you can actually deal with here. So we were able to show this result, um, which again, I'm able to reveal our um, color homomorphic copies of this graph and get the right number of repetitions using this number of colors. Um, and so uh, we were able to get those results. Essentially, the idea was we, we wanted to look for as many different bipartite graphs we could do here and show that they're sufficiently nice under the conditions of that uh, black box theorem that I mentioned. Um, and so we were able to do that with those. Um, unfortunately, one kind of limitation to this technique is that for some technical reasons, uh, this color energy graph, it tends to only be useful when I want the number of colors to be in the super linear range. So here I talked about how if you have about n repetitions, you're at the linear threshold. If you get up to um, and over two, or sorry, if I have p repetitions, you're at the superlinear threshold. If I get up to p minus two or p over two repetitions, you're actually already at the quadratic threshold. And so we're only attacking that range there, but there's a whole lot of um, problems you can ask in the sublinear range when you want to use less than n colors in order in here. Um, and we were able to give some bounds on this problem. We were able to improve some bounds in this problem, uh, but we used very different techniques. 
So for example, here shooting for something like n to the one over n colors, uh, Fish, Bahada, and Sheffer proved this bound. We were able to actually um, shave off a little bit with a, a much simpler proof. Our proof, again, it was only about half a page. There's um, was multiple pages. Uh, then again, though, they were developing a lot of interesting new techniques. So uh, still a lot of merit there. But we were able to get a slightly better bound with a much easier proof. Um, and so uh, we were able to do quite a bit with this, uh, this problem. And so we also have a few open problems to mention if, if anybody's interested. Um, one thing that uh, I think is, is, would be really interesting, I didn't have time to talk too much about this, but the subdivided complete bipartite graph, um, we were only able to actually get this technique to work for um, one side being small. B could be as large as you wanted, but one side had to be size three, if it was size two, you're, you're back in the theta graph case. So we don't worry about that. Um, and the R values we could do it for are only between two and six, but theoretically you should be able to do it for larger R values and um, having uh, either side be a little bit larger. Um, but that's something that we weren't able to do. So it could be interesting to see if you could push this technique a little bit further there. Um, another um, interesting thing and this is a little bit misleading because it's, it's really not clear if this is any easier, but a, an interesting connection here. Um, one thing we, we managed to do is that we made our results on theta graphs and cycles. Well, theta graphs aren't an issue, but for cycles, we made it conditional on the extremal number. So um, what that means is that if somebody were to improve the current known upper bound, on the extremal number for a cycle, that would give us an improvement on Fn PQ for a certain value of P and Q. If you think about what the contrapositive of that statement says, that says if I can prove an upper bound on Fn PQ for, again, certain values of P and Q, that could actually imply a lower bound on the extremal number for cycles. In particular, this rather innocuous looking problem, I mean, it's a Ramsey problem. So even though these numbers aren't too bad, it's, it's still not obvious that this is easy at all. But if you were able to show this, um, then this would actually imply that the extremal number for C8 is um, uh, omega of n to the 5 fourths, which is a well-known, um, very hard problem in bipartite Turan theory. Uh, we really, like this would be a very big improvement over what we currently know. Um, but again, I do want to pre preface that while this is an inter interesting connection, it's really not obvious that this problem is any easier than just trying to attack the extremal number for C8 directly. But it's just, it's, it's an interesting new direction of attack that I, I think not many people have uh, looked at. Um, and actually, there's nothing special about, well, there's something special about these numbers, but you can do this for, for an infinitely many pairs of P and Q. The big thing here is 16 is two times eight um, and 16 choose two is again, like two times eight. I'm looking for the, the second color energy graph here. You could do it for larger ones as well. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, any questions, anyone? And so Sean, um, it certainly looks like the uh, color energy is is an effective technique for for studying um, um, F. <laughs> um, but uh, as you know, it's not in the range that you would like if you wanted to get something for uh, uh, for the diagonal Ramsey numbers. But F, but F is an is a natural enough notion that you wonder whether it has some potential applications other than uh, um, to Ramsey numbers. I mean, have you thought of anything? Um, well, so I mean like this, these like PQ coloring problems have been studied for quite a while. Um, I mean, they, they definitely do have some connections to things outside of just the, the Ramsey numbers. Like I, like I mentioned um, here, we're showing a connection between um, like bipartite Turan and these numbers. Um, there's also, so one nice thing is, uh, do you know about the Erdős distinct distance problem? Uh, uh, 
stated, I probably do. So you want to know, given a, a set of endpoints in the plane, what's the minimum number of distinct distance? Oh, right, right, yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some versions of the distinct distance problem, not just like the main one, but some of them that, that impose local conditions. And actually the um, original author, authors that developed this technique, uh, Cosman Pahada and Adam Sheffer, they were actually trying to study the distinct distance problem and said, well, if you take your distinct distance problem and every distinct distance becomes a color, you kind of forget about the geometry, but lower bounds on this problem can actually give you bounds for the, the distinct distances problem. Again, you're, you're getting rid of all the geometry when you pass into just a graph, but if you can't get lower bounds with the geometry, but you can without, that's at least giving you something. But that's again for the distinct distances problem where you have something like you're imposing a local condition, like um, maybe you want uh, your point set to not have any isosceles triangles. If you impose that, that's um, similar to saying you're looking for every three vertices to um, not have two repeat, like to not have a repetition between them. So that can be phrased in terms of this FNPQ language. Good. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there are there are probably some other applications as well, um, but yeah, that's the um, that's kind of the the one I know the most about. So were they studying in that original paper? Were they studying FNPQ at all, or did you just say, "Oh, their results imply this about it"? Um, so I, I've only heard the story secondhand. Uh, their paper definitely studies FNPQ, um, and then they say how it applies to the the distinct distance problem. But what I heard is that before they had finished their paper, um, one of them gave a talk about it, and somebody in the audience said. Hey, you're you're not like they did it just for the distinct distances problem. And somebody said you're not using any of the geometry. You could apply this to like this graph theory problem. And so then they translated all their results to the graph theory problem, and um, then said, well, we have these bounds for the graph theory problem that then imply this for the distinct distances problem. But again, cool. I'm I'm only hearing the second hand. So um, if any of you know Adam Sheffer, you you might ask him directly because. We'll be able to tell you a little bit more about um, how they they got to this. Other other questions? All right. If not, let's uh, thank Sean again. Thanks, Sean. Say hi to Jabal. Yeah, yeah, I will. I